going to continue our series on Win the Day, a book based upon Mark Batterson, who preaches out of Washington, D.C. And today we're going to focus on flying the kite, flying the kite. On November the 9th, 1847, a civil engineer by the name of Charles Ellett Jr. was commissioned to build a bridge across the Niagara Gorge. Now, Ellett naturally chose the narrowest neck, but still was presented with an impossible challenge. How do you stretch the first wire across an 800-foot gorge with 225-foot cliffs on either side in rapids that led to the waterfall. Well, at dinner one night, Ellett's team brainstormed ways that they could get that first cable across the chasm. And that's when Theodore Graves Hewlett, a local steel worker, came up with a rather ingenious idea that was just a little bit off the wall. He suggested a kite flying contest with the cash prize for the winner. So in January 1948, hundreds of kids tried flying kites across the gorge. It was a 15-year-old American named Holman Walsh, though, that took the ferry from the American side to the Canadian side to take advantage of the prevailing winds. And on January 30th, 1948, Walsh's kite made it across the gorge and it won him the $10 cash prize winnings. You know, 1848, 10 bucks, pretty good. So the following day, they had that successful flight, what they did is they took a stronger line, attached it to the kite string, and it pulled across to the gorge. And then a stronger line and then a rope, and then a cable consisting of 36 strands of 10-gauge wire, and it would become the first railway suspension bridge strong enough to support a 170-ton locomotive. And it all started with one kite string. And if you think about it, it always does. We read it earlier, it says, Do not despise the day of small beginnings. You see, if you do little things as if they're big things, God will do big things as if they're little things. You know, we're in the middle of our series, Win the Day, and so far we've learned to flip the script, kiss the wave, eat the frog, and we want to look again at what it is to fly the kite. If you would, meet me in the book of Zechariah. We're going to unpack this fourth habit here. Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. You know, now I know people who say that they'll give more when they have more. Or they'll say, I'll serve more when I have more time. Or, or that they'll step up when the big opportunity presents itself. But... It's not often true, is it? How you do anything is how you will do everything. Did you catch that? How you do anything is how you will do everything. If we are faithful with a little, we will be faithful with a lot. And I'm told that there's a sign that hangs in the hallways at the basic training camp for the Marines. From the instructors to the instructor's room, rooms, or the the rooms where they instruct, it says, you don't rise to the occasion, you revert to the level of your training. This is what flying the kite is all about. A single kite string can eventually become a bridge that can connect two countries. So look, at, if you would, with me at Zechariah chapter 4. Verse 6. We're going to break this down through some of these verses here as you look in your notes as well. It says, and when we look at this, we need to understand Zerubbabel is the leader, if you will, of a remnant of Israel that has returned to Judah with a God-sized vision to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed 
by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. And now it's about a half a century later, Zerubbabel is staring at this broken down temple. He's seen rocks and rubble laying everywhere. And this is when God says these words. He says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So let's note this. You see, without the help of the Holy Spirit, and I'll confess, I am below average at best. And you know what? So are you. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. You catch that? All things are possible. And why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is, if you will, the X factor. The Holy Spirit is the difference between the best that you and I can do and the best that God can do. I'm going to let you in a little secret. God wants to do things in you and through you that are beyond your ability. They are beyond your resources and they're beyond your imagination. God wants to do those things in us and through us. And why? Why does God choose to do that? So that He gets the glory. It is by His Spirit. You see, you can't feed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. But when you add God to the equation, five plus two doesn't equal seven, does it? Matter of fact, with God, five plus two equals 5,000 with the remainder of 12. Twelve baskets left over. You have more left over than when you started. And that's what he's telling Zerubbabel here. Not by might, not by your power, but it's by my spirit. I'm going to help you achieve this task. All I need you to do is fly the kite. Get it started. Begin the process. That's what I need from you. Let's take a look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, What are you, mighty mountain? Now, do you catch that for just a second? He's talking to the mountain. And there comes a time, a moment in our lives, when we've got to stop talking to God about our mountains. God, this is the mountain I've got to do. And we start talking to the mountain about our God. Do you catch the difference? We can talk to God about our mountain, but there comes a point in time that we start talking to the mountains. Because maybe that mountain doesn't understand who our God is. We have to declare His power. We have to declare His grace, His peace, His goodness, His glory, His love. Whatever that mountain might be, we have to begin to declare who God is. And make sure that they understand, our mountain understands, that He is greater than itself. You don't deny the obstacles that we get. We have them every day. We don't deny the odds, but we confront the brutal facts and we face them with unwavering faith because we have a God who can move mountains and says that we can move mountains with Him. You see, we don't lose faith in the end of the story. We exercise our authority in God we lift it up and we pray, Lord, help me move this mountain. Now, it's important for us to realize that prayer isn't a wish list or anything like that. Matter of fact, every prayer has a two-fold litmus test that we need to be reminded of. First of all, we have to... I have to get called up. Prayer has that two-point litmus test. It has to be in God's will, and it has to be, what? To His glory. Not to mine, not to yours, but it's His will and His glory. We all have mountains, and I have no idea what mountain that you're facing in your life right now. Maybe it's the mountain of anxiety or addiction or anger. Maybe it's the mountain of unforgiveness, the mountain of 
depression or frustration or fear. But I want you to ask this question. What's your mountain right now? What is it that's standing in the way? Maybe you don't feel it's even a mountain. Maybe you're, you're facing a mountain range. And it looks daunting and overpowering. When we encounter these moments... When we encounter those obstacles, we need to remember what we know for sure. And this is what I know for sure, and you should as well, that He is still the God who moves and makes sidewalks through the sea. He's still the God who makes the sun stand still. And He's still the God who turns water into wine. And He's still the God who moves mountains. That's the God that we have. That's the God that we read about in the Bible. That's my God. That's your God. You see, if God did it before, He can do it again because He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's who our God is. You know, in this story with Zerubbabel, we have several, several habits. We need to flip the script, if you will, like we talked about the first habit. We, by speaking to the mountain and we declare that the authority of God that he has. That that mountain doesn't have to stand in our way. That we can go through that obstacle. We have the habit of kissing the wave. You see, the obstacle is not the enemy. You don't go around the mountain. You often have to go through it. And sure, God can deliver around the mountain, but most often, He's going to help you through the obstacle because that's what helps us grow. And here's really the bottom line. We have the authority to move mountains, those obstacles that are in our way, with faith as small as a mustard seed, Jesus said. He who has faith as small as a mustard seed can say to this mountain, get out of my way. Move. We're going to eat the frog. Have it three if you remember. If we want God to do the supernatural, if we want God to do the supernatural, we have to do the natural. We have to do the natural. What are you, mighty mountain? You're a mighty mountain. You're an obstacle. You're what stands within my way of accomplishing what God wants me to accomplish. But my God is greater. My God is stronger. And I have His Spirit. And so do you. Look at verse 10. And this is where the work begins. This is where we fly the kite, if you will, says, do not despise these small beginnings. Do not despise the day of small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. Plumb line. Anyone know what the plumb line is? I haven't seen one in a long time. My dad had one. Probably still has one. Don't know that we use it anymore, but it was the way that you set it down and you make sure that everything's squared up. Plumb line, kite string, whatever you want to call it here. God here, if you think about this, he's rejoicing. He's excited because he sees the plumb line, the kite string in Zerubbabel's hand. He's rejoicing before the job's done. Matter of fact, the job is just beginning here. All they have is the blueprints, if you will, for to rebuild the temple. You see, it's important also to remind ourselves is that God is great not just because nothing is too big, but also because nothing is too small. He celebrates the small steps of faith with us. He celebrates the small acts of kindness in our lives. You know, I think many times we are easily overwhelmed by the size and the scope of the dreams that God gives us. 
or what we read in Scripture and we say, I just don't know how that's going to happen, and we get overwhelmed. I think that's why 75% of New Year's, res New Year's resolutions fail within the first month. And that's why 83% of the people who want to write a book, you know, they want to write a book. But how many do? Very few. Why? Because you can't finish what you don't start. It doesn't matter what it is. We need to begin to reverse engineer our goals and turn them into daily habits. We have to fly the kite. We have to begin to see how we're going to get across that 800-foot gorge, how we're going to build that bridge across the way. So this morning, I'd like to give us at least three keys that we have to flying the kite here. You see, rather than be overwhelmed, we need to be able to fly that kite. First of all, we need to give ourselves a start date. We need to give ourselves a start date. Much of the time, what's the hardest step to take? What is it? The first one. That's right. And I'm guessing that every one of us here this morning have some type of dream, some type of goal that we want to accomplish, but we've put it off. I'll be honest with you. For many years, I've wanted to write a book. I haven't wrote it yet. But how am I going to do that? How am I going to accomplish that? We have to give ourselves a start date. Maybe you want to lose 20 pounds. Maybe you want to read the Bible through the year. And you need to say, I'm going to start, and you put down the date. Now, it's good to have a finish time. You've got to have the finish line as well. But you know, when we look at the finish line, we get overwhelmed. We look at the start date, and we begin to do the begin that process you know often though we make up excuses well I, yeah I'd really like to do that that's really my goal to do in life but we make excuses don't we let's look at just a couple here this morning a couple excuses how about this one I'm not qualified well welcome to the club I don't have enough education not enough experience you remember Moses when God finally said, Hey, Moses, I want you to do the job. What does Moses say? Whoa, who am I? Not me. Moses was full of excuses, wasn't he? And you know what? God wants to use your strong hand, if you will, your talents and your strengths, but he also wants to use your weak hand as well. And let's put that little practical side. Which You all have a dominant hand, right? Which one is it? How many of you right-handers? Okay. Your weak hand, right? Less dominant hand. And I'll tell you what. I, I so much desired when I was younger. I wanted to play basketball. Didn't even know there was a wrestling mat when I was in junior high. Had no clue until the coach looked, saw me one day in a, in a tank top shirt. And he says, Mark, where have you been all my life? You're short and got muscles. Didn't know I should be on a wrestling mat and not the basketball court. So I, I tried really hard to be on the basketball court. And I'll tell you what, for three years straight, three years straight, I tried out and I worked very hard. And guess what? Every year, I was the last one to be cut. I mean, I would, I would take my left hand and I would dribble the ball. And I would work on left-handed layups. Because I thought maybe the coach would be impressed, you know, if I keep doing this and, and get it. You see, but that's the way God is. God understands our strengths because he's given them to us. But he also wants to use our weaknesses. Of course, we're not, we're not qualified. We're not 100% ready to go. He wants to use our weak hand just as much as our strengths. Why? Because it's in our weaknesses that his power is made perfect. And so when God calls us to do something and say, well, I don't think I can do that. I don't have enough skills for that. I'm not educated enough for that. I can't speak like that. God says, don't worry about it. You see, because the Holy Spirit gets involved. Five plus seven doesn't equal seven. It's 5,000, remember, with the remainder of 12. 
we have his spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Or how about this one? I'm not ready. Are we ever? Let's think about this. If we, were, if we went with that, we probably all wouldn't be married. We would not have children. We would never change a job. You see, if you wait until you're ready, you'll be waiting for the rest of your life. I'm just going to wait till I feel it's right, that the time's right. You ever hear anybody say that? Guess what? It rarely comes. It rarely comes. We're never ready. If God has called us to do something, we had best get it done. If you feel that tug on your life and God's saying, hey, I need you to step out in faith and I need you to do this, then we step out in faith. That's what we've got to do. I'm not ready. Well, hey, none of us are. Or how about this? I'm waiting for the right situation. Right? For the right time. Well, aren't we all? George Bernard Shaw says this. He says, people are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances, he goes on to say. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, they make them. Some wise words in that. It is what it is. It isn't probably going to change. Ecclesiastes says this, Whoever watches the wind will not plant, and whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. In other words, at some point in time, we need to cast our bread on the water. We need to fly the kite. We need to give ourselves a start date. Secondly, we need to dream big but start small. Go ahead. Think of something that is outrageous, that is beyond your reach, a God-sized dream, a goal, and step out in faith. Maybe it's to become debt-free. Maybe to pay off your mortgage early. Go back to college and get a degree. You fill in the blank here. What is your dream? Dream big because we have a big God. Commit to a, a daily time with God each day, whatever it might be. It's no surprise, and I've told this story before, when I was younger, my goal, my dream was to become the President of the United States. And my parents let me do that. They encouraged that dream. I could be anything I wanted to be and go ahead and dream that dream. That was until God changed my direction. I remember it well between my junior and senior year in high school. Up until that point in time, everything I did, everything led to pre-law and to go into politics and to become a politician and to become the president of the United States. I had the plan. I, I, I could still tell you what my plan was there. I think I had one mistake as I look back at that, but I, I could have corrected that in time. Same, same mistake that Evan Bayh made when he went to the Senate. Just ruins them all. Anyway, but I had that goal. I had the plan. And it's important to realize this. When God calls you, you need to start moving in faith. Even if it goes against <laughs> what you thought your dream was. God made it very clear what I was to do. God is moving and acting in our world each and every day. He's active and moving in your world every day. And he invites you, he invites me to be a part of it. That is a goal of mine every day. Lord, show me what you're doing around me that I can be a part of your plan. Your will, your glory. It's fun to be on a winning team. And when you see it and, and experience the win, that's amazing, isn't it? So dream big, but start small. Don't be overwhelmed by the size of the goal. I say this to Sonia all the time. I told my older kids this all the time. How do you need an elephant? Anyone know? One bite at a time. Thank you. One bite at a time. 
It's big. It's massive. It's overwhelming. But the only way we get started is one bite at a time. Start small. And I might also add this. We need to think long. Don't forget to look at the future. Sometimes we, we get so tunnel vision that we're just looking here. Okay? And we can't see up there. We're going to run into something. Okay? During the regular NFL season here this year, the Chicago Bears had had a six-game losing streak. Started out really good. You thought, oh, my gosh, the Bears are doing something this year. Okay? But Coach... Nagy, after that six-game losing streak, gave his players a save-the-day card with the date of January the 3rd, 2021, 7 p.m. The significance of that day? That was the day that they would find out the team that they would be playing in the playoffs. They've already on a six-week six skid, six-game losing streak. And on that cusp of, of losing another game, Nagy wanted his team to stop looking at the past, looking where they were, and to look forward, to look at their future. And it worked. If you watched anything about football, the Chicago Bears made it to the playoffs. It was against the New Orleans Saints. You have to, to make a way to remember the future. It helps us when we, we start second-guessing what we're trying to accomplish. And if we forget the future, we trade it in for a bowl of stew, if you will, just like Esau in the Old Testament. He sold his birthright, remember? For that. He sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. What we do today impacts the next generation, and we need to be reminded of that. What we do or flying the kite today it impacts the next generation and the third and the fourth generations. It makes a difference. We need to dream big, start small, and think long. Helps if I put it up there, doesn't it? We not only need to do those two things, but we also need to count every day. We need to count every day. If you want every day to count, count every day. In 2019, Coach Buzz Williams was preparing his Virginia Tech Hokies for their first Sweet 16 game against the Duke Blue Devils in, in 52 years. They hadn't been to the Sweet 16 in that long. But here they were in Washington, D.C., preparing for this game with the Duke Blue Devils. He got his team together, and he did remind them of their record which was good, he reminded them of the number of practices that they had had. 74 to be exact. He was counting their practices. Why? Because it was those practices that had gotten the Hokies to the Sweet 16 game. A game that they hadn't been to in 52 years. It's kind of interesting. He then went on and told, that, he told his team that it was the 1,811th day of his tenure as the coach of the Hokies. Hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? Who, who does that? Who counts those days? I'm barely lucky to know I've been working out at River Terrace for over 13 years. And been preaching here for just about as long. It's kind of crazy. I'm lucky to do that. But who does that? It's someone who is trying to make every day count. Every day count. Do any one of you have anyone who is in Alcoholics Anonymous? You know anyone? <clears throat> of course, if you, do, if you do, ask them what day they are on of being sober. And I'll guarantee you, most of them will be able to tell you. I asked a friend of ours, and she told me her number of days that she'd been sober, and then she went on to tell me this. She says, but you know, on April the 19th, it will be 5,000 days that she has been sober. That's nearly 15 years. Counting 
every day. If you want to make every day count, you have to count every day. If you remember how we started this series, we started out with the question, can you do it for a day? You remember that? Can you do it for a day? And the good news is that anyone can do anything for a day. Can't we? We can do it for a day. And then we have to get up the next day and do it all again. And again. And again. You see, we have to count days because it's about creating winning streaks to be successful. Okay? How many of you play games on your cell phone? I have a game on here. I don't even know what the name is. It's a word game I play with that. Word Trip. And, uh, you know, I, I don't pay attention. I just like improving my mind, getting the words, it sharpens my brain, all those sort of things. And I got up to the point in time it started going because it gives me rewards for every day I've done it in a row. I got up to 195 days until one day I let it slip. One day I didn't quite make it. But guess what? Here's the good news. It starts over, and I'm on day 14 now. I've got a streak of 14. And doesn't that make you feel good when you got a win streak? 14 days. I had 195, but you don't look at the past. You keep moving forward. I've got 14 days now. How many of you got version on your? You got there. Do you use your? Do your Bible reading there? Sometimes. Well, how, what's your streak? It gives you your streak. How many days you've been in there reading the Bible? It's a winning thing. You count the days. You count the days and go, wow, I, I, well, I've done it for that many days? I've done it for 23 days now? Hopefully since the beginning of the year, it should be, I don't know, you do the math. 31 plus 7 should be 38 maybe. Well, I'll have to tell you, I'm not at 38. I think I'm only at 28. I had a break in there one day. I had to cheat and do two on one day. Okay? It's okay. Set the start date. Get it going. Dream big and start small and count every day. Take those wins. Make them and to, to get you going. You see, that's the point that he's telling Zerubbabel. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Fly the kite. You see, God celebrates the small things. And I don't know what mountain you're going after. Sometimes it's also really good to tell the people that you want to do that. I don't know if I've ever told anybody, told, I, yeah, I can't talk. I don't know that I have ever told anybody that I, plan, I would like to write a book. But now that I have, that means you can help me keep accountable. Oh, Mark, when are you going to, write, when are you going to get that book written, Mark? Have you put a start date on it? When are you going to start doing that, making the habit, and develop and doing that? Sometimes it, it takes that. You got to put it out there and, and people hold you accountable to it, right? Right? That's how you do that. It's like having that accountability partner. You see, God celebrates the small beginnings. And I don't know what mountain you're going after, what habit you're trying to break, what problem you're trying to solve. We need to fly the kite. We need to do something. Get started. Don't just stand there like a deer in headlights. We live in a confusing world. Got that. Understand that. But my God is bigger. My God is greater. Not by my might. Not by my power. But what? By my... What is it? Spirit, says the Lord. We have the power. You know, sometimes there are decades that nothing happens. And sometimes there's weeks that decades happen. We need to fly the kite. There are moments in our lives that we just need to fly the kite and we never know if that single kite string might be that suspension bridge to something that we can't even ask for or imagine. To our God who can do immeasurably more than we can ever imagine, all glory, praise, and honor to Him. That's what He tells us. You see, when we don't do these things, we are failing to plan, and we're planning to fail. That's what it really comes down to. That's what it comes down to. Let me ask you this. 
Are you ready to fly the kite? I know it's pretty windy out, and I know it's pretty cold out, and all that. But will you begin to fly your kite today? What is it? Make today your start date. Write it down. What is it that you're going to do with God's help to win the day? Can you do it for a day? Yeah. Can you do it tomorrow? And the next? And the next? To get your winning streak going. That's what it takes. Fly the kite. Stand me with me if you would.